Uh, okay. Next to me, we have Eddie Liu. He is the founder and CEO of Sandman Studios. It's a VR creative studio based in Beijing, which is where you live, yes? Yes. Uh, they produce premium and experimental VR experiences. Um, some of the things he's done is Free Whale, Fresh Out, which was officially selected for the 74th and 75th Venice Film Festival VR competition. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, he's also the founder of and director of Sandbox Immersive Festival. This is China's first VR immersive media festival. So I don't know, how many people have been to the China Immersive Media Festival? Wave your hand. A couple of hands. Good. Um, so that's Eddie. <laughs> and then on the far end, because I'm doing Maria last, on the far end we have um, Adam Rogers. Adam Rogers is creative producer for Intel Studios, focusing on bringing innovative immersive experiences, um, utilizing the, the world's most advanced volumetric capture system. That must be Intel's, right? That is. I figured that might be. That was the commercial message. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he started his career as a producer for Technicolor DVD Studio in London. Um, he did lots of different cool stuff there. He then worked at MPC as a production manager. He, his VFX career finished at Sony Pictures. He had the opportunity to move into VR and head of Tyler Hurd's team at the VR studio Gentle Man Hands came along. He did that until last year, which is when he moved to um, Intel. So we'll hear more about um, what he's been doing there. Thank you, Adam, for coming. And then last but not least, in the middle, we have Maria Rakunashova. Oh, for heaven's sake. heaven's sake. I really was hoping I'd get close. I'm going to call her Maria. Yeah. Maria, <laughs> who has a very complicated Czech name. Correct. Yes, okay. Um, she leads platform partnerships and content acquisition for HTC Vive in Europe. She's based in London. Um, and she obviously drives efforts to create a community of creatives and partners to push the boundaries in VR. So we've got a really great group here. And the way we've thought about doing this is we want to show you lots of clips um, so that you can get an idea of the kind of content we're talking about, because obviously this is about new trends in immersive storytelling. So I'm going to start with a clip that I think is Maria is going to talk about first, but everyone's going to chime in on. So could we play the first clip, which is called, or do you want to set it, set it up first? Yeah, sure. So set it up. Yeah. Um, the why we chose this so as a group, we got to the e together yesterday and kind of looked at the, some of our most favorite pieces, some of the pieces that we have worked on as directors, producers, executive producers, um, to kind of show you a spectrum of uh, really high profile and high quality work. Um, so we will start with a live action piece uh, that's three part episodic. Uh, and what's really interesting about it, um, it's a 360 film, really well produced, high production value, also creatively really touching. It's about um, a married couple who are grieving, who lost their five-year-old son. But where it becomes really interesting is the actual uh, technical execution of the branching narrative. Mm -hmm. um, so the director, so the studio is called Signal Space Lab. They are based in Montreal. They actually come from audio production. And this is their first uh, VR production. Um, and Louisa, who is the director, she kind of shot 28 scenes. And then through the combination of these scenes, you can have 5,000 different outcomes. And it's based on all, you know, on head movements. So where do you look? Which character do you follow? Do you look more at the father? Do you look more at the mother? And then that's how your story evolves. And what's really great is when you have, you know, like film festivals, when you watch it as a group, and then when you come out and then you can share Mm -hmm. the path that each and every one of you has taken. and Because you've obviously been on different paths. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. cool. <laughs> after each episode, you actually see a graph, the path you've oh. taken, and then potential other outc oh, cool. outcomes. Should we see it, and then we can yeah. talk a little bit more about it? So let's, let's play Afterlife. Okay, I'll be back in a few seconds, okay? Don't stand up. Fully prepared for this journey. 
I'm not sure I'm fully prepared for this journey. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little scary. Okay, so Eddie, why is this interesting? A branching narrative, that's... Yeah, branching narrative is in... Uh, it's been pretty common in in game uh, in game storytelling, but in terms of like live action, the very few pieces that is done that way. Uh, the like in in the game uh, realm, the, one of the most well known that is doing a lot of branching narratives are uh, 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 Life is Strange and Detroit Become Humans. These are two two games that are pretty popular. Those and are games. They are the games, yep. but uh, in terms of like branching in in videos. Um, Bandersnatch. Bandersnatch is one of them, uh, but the, the, you do have to click. You do have to make choices. That's true. You like have to make choices. choices. Whereas this one, but you this, look right. Yeah. yeah. Mm. There was an, actually another piece that in Sundance this year is called uh, Mechanical Soul, and they also use gaze mm -hmm. to direct you to different uh, narrative paths. Mm -hmm. So I think more people are started to get, kind of experiment with mm -hmm. um, this kind of. Do you have something to add to this or about? No, I mean it's exciting because it just reminds me of you know back in the day when I'd have those books and it'd be choose your own adventure and you'd have many different stories. With this though, it goes way beyond because you're never going to be able to actually figure out what all the different narratives are. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's uh, you know there's been a lot of talk today about how we keep people's attention in storytelling. Well, this is just another one of these great ways of mm -hmm. like expanding that. Mm -hmm. And you love it, right, this one? Yeah, and the creators, they call it passive interactive because mm. mm. the interaction kind of happens in the background, but you're just immersed in the story. You're just, you know, kind of watching it without partaking. Um, and when you come out, Maria, and let's say we've all watched it in, mm -hmm. uh, in different ways, obviously, yeah. can we still have a conversation? Oh, yeah, of course. There's enough... There's enough common ground. I mean, it will probably ask, oh, did you see the yeah. um, scene with the policeman? Yes, no. Oh, I've seen this. Yeah, OK. <laughs> that's interesting. OK, so um, Adam, let's, uh, if we've talked enough about branching, because that's kind of cool, let's talk about this next one. I think the clip is called Run In. So uh, this brings in what, volumetric? Is that what's? Yeah, so this is actually more of a making of, give you a chance to listen to some of the creators that got involved using the Intel Studio stage in LA. Um, it was really one of the first pieces that we did in immersive, um, and it's a music-based experience which follows the line of what I've been doing the last few years, is trying to bring what is a music video into, a, into an immersive space, and how do you perceive that as the user? Um, and so, yeah, I think it's worth playing the clip. Okay, let's, let's play Run In. <laughs> Oh, that was the trailer, but that doesn't matter, that's fine. Um, so, yeah, what we did with Running, it was using the Intel Studio stage. We had Reggie Watts, if you don't know who he is, he's an amazing performer from the United States, and he has a music project called Wahada. Mm -hmm. um, and so we brought him and his uh, musical partner, John, uh, into the stage with 15 dancers, and over two days we shot them on the volumetric capture stage, which is a 10,000 square foot dome. Mm -hmm. um, and we really were trying to think of ways that we could bring a user into the experience um, and make it interactive. One of the great things about running that has taught me is that there is sometimes an overthinking about what is needed in an experience to make people happy. Mm. Um, as we'll see from some of the other clips we're going to show, there's always been like this buzzword every year about what's new in VR, what needs to be in VR, and actually something that we found with running that simplicity is actually something that makes something great. Mm -hmm. Um, we had a key mechanic in uh, running right up until the week before Sundance where the user had to initiate a lot more to do with the dancing in the space. Yeah. You had to actually do something. Yeah, and then we suddenly realized, well, what do you do when you go to a dance party? You just dance. So it has this really simple <laughs> mechanic, and it's point and click. A lot of people will be familiar with teleporting, but it's done in a way that means you don't have to think about it. You're dancing, you're pointing, you're clicking, and you find yourself moving around the space. Because what we actually did was we created a f like a, a cube of a dance floor, which means you can flip your perspective, but also get up close to the volumetric capture, because we're really trying to showcase mm -hmm. you know, how amazing our studio stage is. 
uh, while also showing some of the amazing art that we're leveraging off this volumetric. Because I think there's been a lot of talk about quality, this, that, and the other with volumetric. Well, at the end of the day, it's art. Uh, and what I'm trying to do with my team and with everyone else I work with is just create engaging art. And it was touched upon in the last session that you know we, we used a lot of creative shader techniques to bring those characters alive. They're real dancers, they're real people, mm -hmm. and they feel like real dancers and they feel like real people. So it's a real step beyond what we've talked about previously, like mocap and sort of traditional animation, which we'll get onto because there's still a place for that. But yeah. I think performance and that feeling of performance is now going to be leveraged much more by the studios, like what we've got on VoluCap I've got here. Because, you know, it's really, it's, it's sort of performance capture on steroids in a way because you're volumetric capture, but you're capturing real people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And as Sarah Vick, uh, my colleague, uh, head of business from the Intel, she spoke about it earlier. It's like... Mm -hmm. You can't get that any other way. Mm -hmm. That movement and that feeling is 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 true to a human mm -hmm. form and the human movement. And I think it's really exciting to now have that technology where we can do full performance and actually, as a as a user, you can feel like you're in that performance with with the characters and yeah. it feels real. Well, and characters that you might even recognize. Them. Exactly. Yeah. So Eddie, when you look at this, I mean, uh, and he said something very interesting about the simple mechanics. Mm. You know, don't make it too complicated. And then right up to the end, it, they were still complicated. They took them out, took them out. Is that something, because, you know, in, in gameplay, that's also important. I mean, is that an important part of this, or is it more about the ca volumetric capture? Uh, I think it's actually the same for all kinds of immersive experience. For, for me, I mean, uh, unless you actually wanted to design experiences that are specifically complicated, uh, you know, like a puzzle, puzzle games that kind of ask you to do various things mm -hmm. uh, in a very complicated way. But most of the experiences that we're trying to create and trying to, uh, uh, we were talking about actually, the, especially those um, experiential and storytelling experiences, uh, there are mostly, uh, we, we do need to, uh, we do need to keep the, the complexity, especially on the interactive part very low mm. so people can get people won't get stuck in the middle of an experience that still has a flow mm -hmm. of emotion flow of uh, of visual that mm -hmm. that drive you through the ex entire experience mm -hmm. rather than just got you stuck in the middle of uh, of of a set or or not really knowing what to do right maria yeah. in a way you need to kind of know what to do. So, yeah, um, I have a really meta experience with this VR experience at Sundance. I came to see it, um, and it was very, I was really into it. I was very much dancing with the Vive controllers, because um, Adam had it running on, on HTC Vive, to the extent that I broke the tracking <laughs> twice. Really? So that was kind of fun. And then, same day, um, Unity had a party where they had Reggie Watts performing. In, so it was it really in real he life, was there. and <laughs> it was really meta to be able to dance with Reggie Watts and these dancers in VR, and then four hours later on Actually real stage me. with the real dancers, real moment, with, with Adam <laughs> yeah, yeah. and everyone else, and Sarah on you know it's, in real life. That dual, was that was reality. the most meta <laughs> <laughs> experience that I've had. Cool. So did you did you go up and, re and say to Reggie, you know what, you actually danced just like you did in the VR? <laughs> yeah, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't break the tracking this time. Oh, that's good. That's good. That's good. <laughs> no tracking. All right. So, 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 really, what we've learned from that is, you know, the, the power of volumetric. Oh yeah. Yeah. And and this idea of point and click and not making it too complicated. Yeah. All right. So, are we ready to do clip three now? This is. Um, I think Maria's going to open yeah. up in this one. This is Gloomy Eyes. Gloomy right? Eyes also premiered at Sundance. Um, and I'm one of the executive producers on this beautiful animation. So it's also a three-part e episodic animation um, created uh, with um, co-production with Atlas V, 3 d Animation Studio from Argentina, Riot in the US, then HTC Vive, um, and Arte in France. Uh, it's narrated by Colin Farrell, and in essence, it's a love story about a zombie boy who represents the world of others, and then a mortal human girl, Nina. And it's a bit of an impossible, but very touching, very kind of um, love story that makes A you bit of impossible, a zombie girl, sorry. <sighs> well, <laughs> it is, everything's possible in VR. Everything's so, possible. Yeah, let's play the trailer. So we have a trailer, and then we also have the making of uh, video that hasn't been shown yet. Oh, great, let's, let's do that. There was a time when the sun got tired of the idiocy of humans and decided to hide and never rise again. Gloomy 
nice is a VR experience. It's a love story that happens with these little tiny characters. They're in danger because the world is full of zombies and dangers. The sun is hiding, so it's perpetual night. That's gloomy. I buried this boy. It's a story about being different. It's a story about belonging. It's a story about finding love and the awkwardness and improbability of love. But for a zombie boy and a mortal girl to find love and somehow for that to be the most beautiful relationship in this world. It's about trying to tell the way that kids can love each other in their ways. And we decided to put two kids bringing some hope in a very dark place. So much of it is the beauty of those claymation-like characters, just absolutely perfectly realized worlds and storylines. I think there's something about small characters that takes you back to your childhood and to the feeling of making toys play with each other and, and become alive. We've been doing animation for most of our lives. We've always wanted to go inside the worlds that we created. So when VR came out, we started having that chance. When we discovered that we could tell a story in VR, we started to think how to deal with do not have the same tools that you have in the screen and discover the new rules, the new tools to tell a story in VR. We wanted to create something that was simple and small and that you could see in front of you without having to have the feeling that something's happening behind you. It's very delicate, the process in VR is. You can easily overwhelm somebody, you can they disconnect. They play a lot with negative spaces, like black environments, and they drive attention with transition. People follow the transition, people follow the lights, and I think the fact that they did that means that they understand the media. 360 degrees, things rising up into your view, things descending from out of view, beautiful sounds, extraordinary music. They told me to bury him in a distant place so that he would never return. Kong's character is the great digger, so he's in between worlds. He's alive, but he spends his time at the graveyard, so he has access to the dead, and he understands both worlds. Just came to life with Colin's voice. His personality, the way he can dig into a line and revel in those moments, just brought power and authenticity to this character that we hadn't even imagined. Because the VR experience they have been able to just keep it about the purity of the story in a way that sometimes in feature film gets compromised because of the scale sometimes of things or the amount of people involved. A cold night, a dark park, but they were together again. We really focused on just getting into the details, knowing that as the project came together, users are going to get very close because it, it's, it has that dollhouse style, but the depth and the complexity of the models demanded that we have detail in all the character sounds. Glumia is a three-part animated series. It's an impossible love story. People will want them to not be in love, not to succeed, and only at the end of episode three, you'll know what happened. I hope we can really share this experience with everybody. And I'm so proud of our experiment. It's been amazing for us. The most beautiful thing I've ever been a part of. So for me, it's been a very unburdened experience and um, I'm one that's just been a joy to be close to. So oh, yeah, it's available now on Viveport. Episodes yeah. one and two are now out on Viveport, which is our own uh, content distribution mm -hmm. VR app store. And um, yes, yeah, so episode two actually launched for Halloween because obviously the main character is a zombie. And then episode three will launch next year for Valentine's Day because at the end of the day, it's a love story. And will you put it on other platforms? Yeah, it will also go on other platforms as well, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. but sort of you're, you're doing the... The premiere, so to speak, yeah. is going to be on Viveport. That's right. Well, and this piece... As one of the co-producers. This piece is definitely one of the best pieces that showcases storytelling in VR. Mm -hmm. And I think it goes against the notion and some of the comments that I've heard over the... It, not only at this event, but generally, like, we're still figuring out storytelling. Well, I disagree a little bit. I think we figured a lot out in the last two years about how to storytell in VR. And I think Gloomy Eyes particularly is one that demonstrates that along... We're not going to show a clip today, but while I'm talking on this point, I think uh, Wolves in the Wall is another way mm -hmm. of showing how we've really developed storytelling. And this particular piece uses AI. So you are in the piece, and if, the, if you move, the character moves with you. So you never lose sight of the character, you never lose mm. the story. Mm. 
you know, we'll talk about it a bit more later, but I think we're now figuring out how to distribute this stuff because this is next level storytelling, gloomy eyes for sure. Yeah. And unlike other pieces that we're going to show, you don't use hand interactions. You're kind of passive observer here, but you very much feel close to the characters and very much feel part of the story because, um, you know, as the guys in the trailer said, you have these revolving miniature dollhouse, doll miniature worlds that are almost each and every one of them kind of, you know, unfold in front of your eyes or yeah. here or behind you. It looked to me you. like the, the, the cues, and help me out, Eddie, if you can, uh, were about, like he said, following the light. Like if, if the light started, you your eyes went that way. So it is, a, it is actually a linear narrative, I yeah. guess. It yeah. is a linear uh, narrative, uh, but they use both sounds and uh, visual cues to mm -hmm. actually drive you through the entire 360 mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. sphere. Uh, and this one is a, uh, it's a passive, yeah. it's a passive storytelling experience. Yeah. But also there are some very good, uh, if it's a miniature experiences, there are also very good ones. Uh, whereas, uh, sorry, uh, the, the wolves in the wall are like a one-to-one -one in size, but there was also another one, I uh, personally, one of my personal favorite is, uh, is uh, Alinea, uh, The Line. It's actually from Ricardo's ah, La Linea. Uh, 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 studio. Uh, which also won award in uh, Venice this year. Mm -hmm. And uh, that one is a more interactive uh, piece. Mm -hmm. So basically you do have to uh, interact with this with the miniature set in order to move, uh, push But it's the like this because it's this miniature forward. idea, is that? It's also miniature, it's yeah. also miniature. The miniature kind of world is really fascinating actually because I think it does focus you, you know. Um, you, you're sort of in it. You feel it creates yeah. intimacy. Yeah, it, yeah that's exactly. it. It creates intimacy. Cool. Yeah, I especially like if the creators are playing with mm. space, you're falling or the character is falling, so you have to kind of, you know, with your whole full body, you have to kind of almost sit on the floor to be able to interact. And that's something that Ricardo and their, his studio Armory did also in the line, mm -hmm. um, where there is this very kind of epic moment of um, the character kind of changing. Um, direction in the story and then he becomes the, the hero and you need to guide him through yeah. to accomplish his little path to find his way back to to his love and you know another love story love stories really work yeah. they work yeah. 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 Really yeah. Sure. <laughs> so we've, we've learned that music works <laughs> love stories work all right I, and anything emotional <laughs> emotional work Lots of yeah. anything that triggers emotions yeah. horror experiences the right horror work yeah. Yeah. trigger fears right so yeah so. so the next one is is Clip four, I think we're talking here about more interactivity. Glimpse. Is that the idea? Yeah. So who wants to cue this one up? Glimpse is Glimpse. also a love story. Uh, of course it we is. We're also <laughs> um, producers on it. Um, I'm one of the lucky EPs. So Glimpse is a love story where you embody Herbie, a heartbroken panda. And in <laughs> essence, you're an illustrator. Um, and you are reminiscing through um, the memories that are expressed as kind of sketchbooks um, or, you know, little drawings that you have done. Mm -hmm. And you're kind of reflecting back on your four-year-old, like, long relationship with um, Rice, the deer character. Uh, and she's an aspiring musician. And Herbie is voiced over by Taron Egerton. All oh, right. Who also voiced over Johnny, the gorilla in Sing and also played in the Elton John movie. Yeah. And then the Rice, the deer character, is voiced over by Lucy Boynton, who oh. played alongside Rami Malek in Bohemian Rhapsody. Yep, yep. And she's now also in the Netflix series, The Politician. It's a beautiful cast, beautiful love story. And what's really interesting here, well, uh, the first kind of six minutes premiered at Venice Film Festival. And on the back of Venice Film Festival, the directors kind of went back to the drawing board. And they will be in the final piece um, well, we will make you cry for sure. Um, you, they will play with uh, kind of first person view, third person view, 2D, 3D in a very kind of seamless, seamless way, kind of combining elements from, you know, other VR experiences that animations that, that have worked. So they out. actually went to the festival, showed it, and they've mm -hmm. gone back There's and always lots of learnings. Re edited yeah. it. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then obviously, as a panda, you use the controllers to pick up objects that then trigger these memories and that's how the story unfolds. So yeah, let's let's okay. play the trailer. Play the clip. Is this right, Mr. Kite? Yeah. Okay. Don't 
Mr. Rule of Fitzroy said in the past. I love you, it's nice. Thank you. Howdy. Howdy horses, hold your tongue. I'm the rich and spare the Who drain the spirits from the jars. Half of them say. about that um and we've seen it already in the other one too you're using you know name brand talent to do the voices is that important i would think um well you could obviously use other people to voice over the characters but i think you know the, these people that are talented they really know what they're doing and also giving a lot of personality and bring these characters to life and then there are recognized actors and performers. Which also helps to raise the profile. Yeah, it yeah. helps to raise profile. And on the back of that, you know, that helps creators raise funding for, for, for the creation of these projects. And unlike um, Gloomy Eyes, Glimpse is actually a seated experience. Oh. Uh, and you use the controllers to, you know, be the panda because in essence you're sitting in Herbie's studio and, you know, you're kind of looking through your sketchbooks. Mm -hmm. And then with Gloomy, you need to use your whole body to kind of like walk around. Right. And same in, in, in the line. So, Eddie, I mean, yeah. I think there was something we we're not going to show that was called Carrot. Is that, is that sort of also interactive? I mean, what was... Yeah, uh, it, was, it was an early piece that we did last year from uh, my studio that we produced. Uh, so basically, it's a, it's, a, it's a cute little story... Uh, about uh, uh, three carrots talking to each other uh, about a, about a horror story that's gonna be eaten by a monster, right? Uh, and they, but the end is actually <laughs> they, they've been eaten by a monster or eaten by a, uh, a, a mouse. So basically, mouse. there are there there are, they're also kind of branching narrative. There are two different endings. Uh -huh. So based on the your your so uh, you your action, you, yeah. your actions mm -hmm. uh, in the final scene, you would get to direct. Directed to, mm -hmm. to either of the endings, so so yeah, I mean interactivity is also kind of important. Well, they're always very good passive experiences, story story experiences, but they're also uh, very interesting to to explore the, uh, how interaction can can play a role in, in in storytelling. So, what if you don't interact in these, Adam? I mean, will it just play, or do you have to interact to, for it well, to make it move? Well, I think. If we show chocolate, and I mean, I mean, there's a consideration when we were doing the work with when I was working with Tyler Hurd, um, is that music should drive everything that happens in an experience. We don't want to actually uh, give people too much to do because, <laughs> you know, if you're watching a music experience, you, the music should be driving every part of the visual, which is exactly what you do when you watch a 2D video. Right. It's right. everything's to the beat. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's challenges, though, and I think it's actually a good segue into the next clip. I don't know which yeah. one's going to come first. It'll either be chorus or chocolate. I think chorus is first. If so, yeah, yeah, but, you know, what we had to do, where, where chocolate is a four-minute music track, once you jump to seven minutes, which what chorus is, you then hit the boredom, the boredom point. You need to actually give people more to do to make them keep engaged. Um, uh, sometimes, and with music especially, when it's when it's when it's a repetitive track, mm -hmm. you know, not so much when we're talking about like walls in the walls or or gloomy. It's a story, it's linear, but it can keep you gazed okay. for 30 minutes, and that's one of the things that has been really rewarding this year, seeing some of the content because I I have been in VR for five years now, but. I'm a six-minute guy. I'm like, I'm done. <laughs> I'm a six-minute guy. I'm a six-minute guy. With I'll, I'll keep with, that in mind. Yeah, with, v <laughs> <laughs> with VR. But, but what has been really impressive this year is that I've been spending 25 minutes in a headset and I haven't realized. Huh. But with the stuff that I've been doing with the music, there comes a point where you have to think about people and how they're going to react after a certain time. So what we did with Chorus, we actually put in this mechanic. Now, chorus is a um, multi-person music experience. It's up to six people at one time, whether remotely or collectively. Oh, I see. So you're doing it together. You can do it together, yeah. Mm. Uh, social, social experience. Social experience. Social social experience. experience. Okay, so that's what we're learning from chorus. Yeah, yeah. animation, okay. social, but also what about interactivity and how do you keep the, the user engaged? Keep, and keep the beat going. Keep the beat going, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So with Chorus, you know, we give you that aspect where you can talk, you can interact with one another, which is super cool, but then there is that point where it's like, okay, 
what next? So what we ended up doing is we actually figure out how to manipulate the users. Ooh. We make them think they're doing something interactive, but really we're just making them doing an action that when they're actually out, when you're looking from outside the headset, they're dancing. Ah. <laughs> so we provided them with these dance lasers and these kind of birds that you have to swipe away, and it's all timed to the music. I love it. But you're not really affecting a game, but you're still interacting with it. So it's a really sort of that bridges that gap a little bit, and it's super fun watching people just there. I love yeah. that. I love that we they're make, like, I don't dance. We make them they're dance. They're like, I, I don't dance. <laughs> they don't even know they're dancing. They're hitting the window. Yeah, and then you dance. throw in the video after, and they're like, oh my god. <laughs> oh my god, I was dancing. All right, should we play chorus? Let's play yeah, clip let's play five. Chorus. That's a fun one. <clears throat> Which sound would be good? <laughs> Here we go. So we should point out that this experience, when you put the headset on, you become one of six intergalactic female warriors. <laughs> six intergalactic female warriors. Six <laughs> intergalactic right. females. Um, and <laughs> that project was great because it gave us a chance to really the branch out with our team. And um, yeah, very proud of the team we put together for that because it was, it was definitely a female powerhouse that led that. <laughs> Let me and Tyler were just pretty much in the background, just letting the team do their work. Um, oh. And it, the result is really fantastic. Um, um, but previous to that, you know, and we're kind of sitting in the animation world here, you know, we've jumped from sort of, you know, what we were talking about, live action, live volumetric. Action. This is how leveraging um, animation. And one of the exciting things as well about the work that I was doing with Tyler is, is that we were leveraging um, VR tools to create VR, um, including animation. Uh, everything you see in Chorus is puppeteered. So it was rigged traditionally, but all the animation was done through using Tyler's uh, bespoke system where you, he assigned each, each limb, each muscle to the controller, and everything was done organically. So it's a bit like a Jim Henson puppet show. Yeah, okay. And so that's, that in itself, you know, where we were saying volumetric is kind of real and obviously live action. With these new puppeteering tools, you're still getting that human performance mm -hmm. in it. It's not so rigid. And I think if you watch the difference between chorus and chocolate, which was traditional animation, you'll definitely see those nuances in there. And I think that's really exciting because not only does it mean that we get from the creator side, we get this really organic, we're also starting to see how lesser, um, or people like me, for instance, who can't animate using uh, Maya or don't know how to use, can pick up these tools and they can start animating, creating in VR. You know, not only animation, but you've got uh, Medium, which is a modeling tool. You've got Tilt Brush, which is a paint tool. You've got Quill, which is also an environment tool. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully in the next few years, we'll start to see a lot more um, creators use these tools to create some really interesting experiences. Because the tools aren't that hard to use. Basically. They're, they're basically yeah. there now, and they're all free as well, which yeah. is what's really exciting. You know, uh, if anyone's in the audience thinking about how do I create VR, well, start thinking about creating VR in VR. Yeah, yeah. And those two have been iterating and uh, evolving mm -hmm. also in the past few years. Yeah. It's changed so so much. So it's a lot easier, I assume. A lot easier know. and it's very useful and also can animate like the, the new uh, uh, version of the quill. You can also animate all different kinds of characters and assets. Mm. And it's amazing, and isn't it? Yeah. I mean, you really, you get your creative juices going to, in yeah. VR. Now, do, should we see chocolate? Yeah, let's show chocolate because chocolate's a fun one. Um, and it, again, it, it sort of plays into that, you know, what, what do you give interactivity versus, you know, making it more passive? And uh, I'll give you the premise of chocolate. Chocolate, you are a robot god in a cat-centric world. <laughs> 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 and I love these. <laughs> it's a music piece to a guy called Giraffage, and his track was called Chocolate. Um, and so, yeah, basically, you put the headset on, you see yourself in the mirror as a three-legged robot, the tracks, and then when the, when the music hits the crescendo, your hands turn into speakers, obviously, obviously. and then cats yeah. come flying out. Oh, cats, good. Yeah. So let's take a look. Why is it called chocolate? Because we, we basically follow the name of the track. Okay, uh, sorry. From the okay. We want to keep <laughs> that, that consistency. Okay, let's watch chocolate with the hands turned into speakers. <laughs> So 
So that's it's more traditional animation, right? That's more traditional okay. animation, <laughs> uh, four minute song, and just relying on the music to generate the, the experience around you. And uh, you know, when the music hits the beats, you just get to, you get to catch the cats as well, which is super cute. Mm, super we all cute. love cats. Gotta have cats, right, Maria? I like cats. <laughs> <laughs> I like dogs even more. <laughs> okay, so I now we're gonna, we're gonna talk. Maria, you're gonna talk us through mm -hmm. Doctor Who, yeah? Unless mm -hmm. you wanted to say something. Yeah. No, it's I, I just say uh, Chuck is my 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 all-time favorite. Actually. Your all-time favorite, <laughs> yeah, really? Yeah, it always makes me smile and happy every time I go in. Yeah. Carrots you. is one of my favorites. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Okay, so feel the love, <laughs> I say. Okay, yep. Next so, so up, Maria, talk we about, uh, have Doctor, Doctor Who, and it came out on all the um, VR platforms last week. And the reason why we selected it is because it's a television IP, you know, originating in the UK. It's been around for I think 70 years, and it's popular even in China and, and the US. And um, Mace Theory, who are the indie studio who created it. Um, they worked very closely with the BBC and actually got a writer from the BBC involved. Mm. And in essence, it's a puzzle adventure um, game. It's a great game, but if you're a fan of Doctor Who, even better, because um, we went uh, with the guys from May Theory to some of the Comic Cons, like in London, and it was just an incredible experience <laughs> to see the fans to absolutely go bonkers right. over, you know, getting into. VR and you know, hearing jo Jodie Whittaker, who is the the current She's doctor. She's the current doctor. And they even came dressed up as Jodie Whittaker or you know oh, some of great. the characters. So they were like really, really, really into it. What really helped is also BBC um, brought the, the props, the Daleks, the TARDIS. Oh, great! To the show. Um, so yeah, great response. And it's an interesting thing that BBC decided to actually create um, a video game out of this TV IP. In yeah, order because to I think that might, have been, that might have been political in the sense that, you know, that's a, one of their premier properties. Yeah. So yeah. They, they actually they did wouldn't also want to mess it up, you know um, what I mean? They also created an animation piece. Yeah, um, Run, Run, Runaway. Yeah, The yeah. Runaway, Runaway, which is also yeah. brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. So two very different executions. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's show the trailer of the game that just came out. Doctor Who. This is the story of how you died. It's had a million different times and places. Our reality itself ceased to exist. Cool. Yeah, there's a few jump scares hidden in the game. <laughs> J jump scare, okay. Uh, yeah, with the weeping angels. And uh, what's really great that um, the story is really wonderful and uh, the game actually got selected by two film festivals, Venice this year and also mm. Rain Dance. Wow. Um, and actually, it's not the only or the first kind of TV IP made into a game. So there's also Game of Thrones did a VR experience. Westworld also just came out. They teamed up with Service, uh, which is a big game. Star Wars. So yeah, obviously Star Wars mm -hmm. and Walking Dead is coming. Actually, two I mean, Walking Dead. I mean, these ones must just work, right? Because they've got the brand awareness. Yeah. I mean, you know, I I look at that trailer. I recognize, you know, the Weeping Angels. I recognize the TARDIS. I recognize, you know, the the what's it called? Sonic the screwdriver. The Sonic screwdriver. <laughs> you know, so it's like, you know, all those things. In a way, because one of the things we've been talking about is, you know, how do you get people to know what to do? When you you see that, you kind of know what to do because you know what to do. You know how. The you doctor have works. a sonic screwdriver, you have a lightsaber, 
whatever that is, but yeah, works really well for an interactive piece or a game. So how, how you, it's on HTC Vive? It's on Viveport and also other platforms. Okay. It came out actually, uh, really kudos to the team who managed to release it on six VR platforms. Wow. wow. On launch day. Do we know how it's well done already or? It's doing, I mean, reviews and, and ratings on our platform are positive and when I look at like on Steam, PlayStation and Oculus, it's the same. Hmm. And it's also people who are not necessarily fans of VIP but are, are just gamers, oh, see, they respond to it. Too. Yeah, so it's actually expanding the franchise, as yeah. you say. Yes. <laughs> okay, so c that's complex gameplay, right? That's what's oh, yeah. cool about Lots this. Lots of puzzle solving. And puzzles. Yeah. You need to okay. know what you're doing. You need to know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, I'd probably get stopped. <laughs> and what? What do I do now? Um, okay, so we've talked really about sort of complex gameplay that sort of ends that section. So, Eddie, do you want to do the next one, which is um, Mandela, I think? So yeah. we're going to talk about immersive theater. So, yeah, Mandela is an is a experimental uh, project that we... we we developed develop from the beginning of the year, and we actually showcased it in uh, in, in uh, the festival we organized in China, Sandbox Immersive Festival. And it's a uh, it's an immersive theater piece that you uh, that put three audience uh, in VR headsets uh, in a for the whole time, and to be interacting with two different virtual characters. But actually, they're they're being played by only one. Uh, actor, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. but two two different characters uh, that you have to kind of go through a uh, a journey of of faith and betrayal mm. um, in in a in a, in a, in a Chinese fantast uh, fan fantasy um, setting. Mm. And why why is it immersive theater like? I mean, is it because of the way it's yeah? Because it's a so basically the entire experience is driven by. Uh, the actor, the the live oh, actor, okay. as as well as the feedback and responses from the three audience. So the entire um, the the convers well, basically, you, you will be able to, uh, as an audience, will be able to touch and hug and uh, you know uh, have physical mm. uh, touch with the with the actors, and okay. uh, the actor will actually drive the entire story is based on the conversation between him and also the the audience. Wow. So it'll be very free, kind of freestyle. Uh, uh, improved, improv, um, uh, improvised, uh, improvised yeah. way. Yeah. Cool. Should we watch it and then we'll talk? Yeah, about we it have more? a less fancy. It's not as fancy as the other ones, but okay. it's a very, very techy, techy one. But yeah. All right. Let's play that clip uh, eight. So that was the set. So Thank that you. really, and is that, how long has that been out? Um, you mean the, the... The experience. The experience, the length of the experience is 20 minutes. And 20 we, minutes? Uh, well, it kind of varies, but depends on how, how you're going to interact with the actor. Okay. And how long has it been available for people to play or interact with? Um, no, no, I mean, we don't have a, like a permanent place to showcase oh, the work, so but we only showcase it at the festival. I so got it. So you actually... Very few people actually got to try it. Got it. I got it. So that's what we were seeing. We're actually seeing them in interacting with... Yes. The, so you actually have to have the actor there every time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Wow. Yeah. So that's a... So it's like a theater play. So mm -hmm. basically you do have to have one or a, a, a group of uh, mm -hmm. uh, actors and actresses mm -hmm. to be performing mm -hmm. the entire mm -hmm. performance uh, for mm -hmm. the audience. So, so it's more to kind of, right. it's more towards a, a theater kind do of Do you method. think, do you other, do Adam and Maria, do you think that this is going to be one of the, um, we're going to see more of this sort of experiential? Definitely. Uh, I, mean, it's I know been brands a year love for it. Really yeah. a little bit. I think the first one was Alice in yeah. Venice mm -hmm. in 2017, 2017. Mm -hmm. yeah. by DV Group where obviously there was also a live actor and you could kind of walk up on, you know, ceiling and it kind of changed your perspective. And another one, I think it's worth giving a shout to Satori Studio um, for their piece Cosmos Within Us, okay. which also premiered at Venice Film Festival this year. And what it actually is, um, 
It's very, very interesting format. Very, very interesting format, very different. So imagine a setting like this. Uh, people are in a theater, and you can have, so at Venice they had five people. Um, at Rain Dance Film Festival they had 10 mm -hmm. people in the audience. And then last week I was actually at VR Days in Amsterdam where they had 100 people in a kind of theater setting like this. So there are 100 people in the audience who are spectators. And then there is one person who comes on stage, um, which, which is where they have their playing area. And that one person is in headset. And then what they are seeing in the headset, you can see on the big screen. Ah. So in essence, the experience for the person in the headset is like the camera. Uh -huh. uh, and they not always know that, that you know, there is an audience there. And then <laughs> there is live orchestra. So there is wow. musicians who are playing the music oh. live. It's beautiful. It's really dramatic, really emotional. The narration is live. So there is a live actor who is narrating it in real time. And then there are two directors. One is the creative director who is directing the musicians, who is directing pretty much everything, also the narrator. Mm -hmm. And then also the kind of VFX director who sits there in front of a computer and in real time in Unreal Engine, he is pressing buttons and you know defines visual effects wow. that are happening in the story based on the response of the person on the headset. So it's wow. kind of both a spectacle and, yeah. and a viewer experience. And I would say the more the smaller the setting, the more intimate it is. Mm -hmm. So in Venice, I was one of the people in the audience and it's a 30 minute performance. I was in the headset. Oh, nice. <laughs> I <laughs> cried really? and I wept yeah. and I was just in, you know, in the audience and, it, you know, it was, you were in a dark room, so yeah, yeah. people tended to kind of cry. When you're in a bigger setting, you know, with 99 people around you and there is a bit of light, maybe less so, but yeah, it's a really, really interesting concept. And also, you know, they will be charging tickets for this, just like That's when you great. go to the theatre. Yeah. yeah. And there's also, there are all different kinds of formats. So, so uh, uh, Mandala is similar to Alice, which is, uh, it, we actually uh, co produce with Digital Rise, which is one of the core, mm -hmm. uh, there are some core teams from, from DB Group as well, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which is the director was uh, Thomas Velopu. Um, and th that one is only kind of one type of immersive theater work. Uh, and Cosmos Within Us is another one which is kind of kind of opposite uh, side of it. <laughs> um, but we are now actually working on a, a bigger one, which is uh, for 300 people. Uh, 300? Yeah, 300 people well, uh, watching a trial in the underworld. Uh, you, you will get to interact. You, you will have a very light interaction. So you, can, you can vote. How about a the trial in the house? Of oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can actually vote uh, <laughs> during the entire process whether that person yeah. should go actually to the deeper hell or go back to the human. human oh, world. I like this. Uh, <laughs> uh, go back yeah. to life. <laughs> uh, but that one is kind of opposite side of uh, Cosmos Within Us because we want to put everyone into the headset to yep. watch yep. the entire experience, right. Right. Mm -hmm. interact with the entire story for the whole one hour setting. Um, but I do think like Cosmos Within Us as, as the opposite side, which most of the people are out of VR and watch someone inside VR, it's, it's very mesmerizing. Mm. Uh, um, cool. Yeah, it's a very interesting model. So we can see all different kinds. Yeah. So I just want to see if there's anybody in the audience who has a question because we're coming to the end of our time. So there's a hand there and there's a hand there. Peter, do you have a mic? Yep. <coughs> Hello. Thank you very much for, for telling us about the the um, immersive theater and new formats, uh, maybe a bit of appetizing where Mind Sound Productions coming from Berlin. We've also been at VR Days last week um, with a piece that we call Me and My Brain. And um, we have a similar mechanism um, as um, Cedra Studios with Cosmos. So we have developed a concept that we call Black Box together with the Bauhaus University where we have one person inside the VR glasses and um, the audience uh, watching outside. Um, you can see it. Um, in two weeks in Weimar at the Bauhaus University again. Um, and we find, we, we call it a shared social space. Um, the experience is about the brain and it's also neuroreactive. And we actually start the experience even outside um, when, when people start lining up and we find out who is the one who's wearing the VR glasses. <laughs> and we lead them through and have an outro. And um, we do think that people react to that very positively and it's kind of a new format. 
Um, so my question to you is, do you see more of these developments coming? And do you see interest also from, say, theatrical spaces? Or do you also see from, from people that are actually at the moment in these very diverse settings like cinema, theater, is there an interest from those spaces um, that you see towards these kind of experiences? Or is it more something that comes out of the creative community uh, and has yet to be discovered? I think it's both. Um, in, the, in London, um, there's um, the National Theatre, and they have been showing uh, kind of VR pieces or VR performances since, I think, 2017, pretty actively. So I think it depends on every single institution. And also, us as a VR community takes our effort to educate them, to invite them to these events, to help them understand these new formats, and then truly, you know, see th what the benefits are, and then work then with you guys, the creators. Mm -hmm. And I do think there's there are quite a lot of people coming from the, uh, theater space coming over to tr uh, to develop experiences uh, in VR and AR uh, using live performances or live uh, live. Uh, uh, orchestra or performances, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, especially actually from from UK. <laughs> um, Shakespeare, Royal Shakespeare Theatre Company. Yeah, yeah Royal well. Shakespeare Company, uh, um, uh, Punch Drunk. Uh, they all. Yeah, there are a lot of uh, yeah, theatre yeah. companies yeah. trying to you know. No, I think in. I actually think it would Very be interesting. just a whole new thing. They'd love it. They'd love to embrace it. Really change the th changes the theatrical experience. And also, what's interesting is that. Uh, the theater people are trying to think and design the story with space in mind, mm. as opposed to like a, a, a filmmaker, traditional filmmakers, they're thinking about um, uh, cuts, Frame. uh, frames, I'm sorry. Frames, yep. um, and uh, theater people have to design the whole space. Right. Right. So it has kind of space, spatial design right. in mind. Yeah. So I think that can That's translating into the volumetric as well, you know, with the stuff yeah. that we've been creating. It's, it seems a much more natural fit to have a dome for a theatre director yeah, versus exactly. a traditional yep. box director. Exactly. Yeah, but I also think as well, like the theatre stuff, there's almost a little bit of reaction to the current market as well, and it's another way of getting people in headsets mm -hmm. um, to bring them communally together mm -hmm. and provide mm -hmm. an entertainment that's, that's viewable, because obviously, as we know, we've seen so much great content today, but we're lacking in distribution channels. Yeah. How do you to actually get it, it out there? Yeah. yeah, I think it's a great idea, and it, get them into a theater. With a di it's a different kind of experience. You don't have to go buy the headset, you borrow the headset, yeah. you, you know. Well, it's also looking at ways for engaging the younger, younger yeah. community, younger society to engage in traditional sort mm -hmm. of theater and arts. And, and it's not such a great leap. I mean, think about the globe. It was theater in the round. I mean, we've done theater. You know, we've done that kind of theater before. So it's just anyway. Taking yeah, the also, next theater step. experiences are usually like um, commu communal uh, and, yeah, and yeah. Uh, social mm -hmm. yeah. because you yeah. usually go with friends right. and, and you can share sure. the moment. That's true. Yeah. We have one more question. Yeah. Here it is. Hi, um, I'm a huge VR supporter. Uh, I buy a lot of VR software, but after a couple of years, I still feel like a nerd because the mainstream uh, breakthrough isn't there. So what do you think, how many years we still have to wait for mainstream audiences to adapt this technology? And which player do you think has the best chances? Is it Sony, is it Vive, is it <laughs> Facebook? You know, those are the kind of questions. It's really hard because, I mean, yeah. you can answer this. But, I mean, it's hard because, you know, who's going to win? Betamax or, right? I mean, it was like, you know, we don't, you know, these are, com these, yeah, yeah. a lot of it's commercial. So, anyway, go, Maria. I mean, you, you know, we all are in this for the long, long, long term and the long run. Uh, we're all doing our best, pushing the tech, pushing the software, pushing the hardware, uh, you know, getting feedback from people like you. Um, I, I actually think we're not that far away. Uh, 2020 will be a leap year for sure, um, especially with the you know six degrees of freedom standalone headsets, which have a much more accessible price. And also, creators are learning in terms of like graphics capacity, how to work with um, the mobile-powered processors, the, the headsets that, that have mobile-powered processors. So I, th I think it's it's coming, and you know, just all of you guys who have a headset, like, get your friends into it. Show show it what what it feels to be in VR, um, why they should care, and why sh they should buy one, or you know, embrace embrace it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not just for gamers, clearly not. And yeah. even though they are the kind of early adopters of of the headsets for now, but mm -hmm. for sure, you know, it won't stay like that. 
So Adam, when you look at this, obviously Intel has skin in the game in terms of you know chipsets and things. But I mean, are we going to have to have a winner and loser? Or are there going to be several platforms you think are going to work? Or what's going to happen? I mean, if, it's hard to say really, hard to, to be say. honest with you right now. I think you know we talk about headsets, but really they're all tied into distribution as well. And I think as long as we get those distribution models set up and there's engaging content across the different headsets, I know there's probably a market for all. I, I look at what's on the market right now. We've got two standalone headsets. We've got the Cosmos. Focus Plus. Focus and Plus. Then the Cosmos. Quest. And the <laughs> Quest. Those, to me, are just brilliant. It just it, it takes away the notion of this technology being inhibitive because mm -hmm. you now have the freedom. And I, I do think we're close. I think we need to be brave and continue down this path because it's only a matter of time. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know from friends at Facebook who are working on the next generation Quest, you know, from what I hear about that headset, you know, we're getting closer and closer. You know, we've just got hand tracking without controllers. Like, it's slowly evolving to where we want it to be. But really, the main thing right now is certainly for creators like us and in where we're at, where we're not specifically games, it's, it's distribution and it's having a place for content to live, place that's easy, accessible, but then use it like we were talking about, like using the metadata, aggregating and giving you content mm -hmm. that you think you want to watch mm -hmm. right. after you've watched a piece of content. Right now it's a minefield and you don't yeah. specifically know where right. to find and that's the frustrating element because, you know, chocolate was done three and a half years ago. But on the plus side, the thing that I'm also confident about is that there's a lot of content that's sitting on the shelf ready for that explosion. And I think for most people, if you watch chocolate in 2020 versus in 2016, it still looks as good as it did four years ago. So mm -hmm. there's going to be hopefully an opportunity for a renaissance of content that's been sitting on the shelf and maybe only been at festivals. But So it'll, it'll be a combination of getting these headsets yeah. more, let's say, usable, uh, cheaper will help as well. Yeah. Cheaper for sure. Yeah. yeah, cheaper for sure. And then, you know, if you look at it, every single VR platform, you know, you open them and they, they curate the content. So it, every piece of, you know, content game app or experience that's out there that's being featured is featured for a reason. Because all of us who work for these companies, who we, you know, we engage with the creators, we watch these pieces, we know they are good. And, you know, some of them are more into the gaming genre, some of them are more into storytelling genre, but it's our job to actually pick out those chocolates of the world or the carrots of the world or mm -hmm. the gloomy eyes of the world or the Doctor Who's of the world and actually believe in them and then help the creators to complete them. And is most of this stuff sitting on them. multiple platforms or is there a lot of um, siloing? In other so words, if it's a Vive, most then it's VR only experiences on Vive. that obviously are able to reach um, the necessary amount of funding, they release on all platforms. Um, you know, they might take one platform as the lead platform for development and then they kind of like port it all, all yeah, over the place, and let's be which honest is about, working it's out well. It's not hard to it's create not, yeah. something from multiple headsets, so that really isn't the issue because the you hurdle. do one for Vive, it'll be easy to port to the Oculus, and, vice versa. and it's just, and I think it's like you know we know where to go for our music videos. We go to YouTube. I know where to go for music MP3s. It's either you know SoundCloud or. Um, Spotify, I know where to go for movies, um, Netflix. It depends where you, what headset you're yeah, in. And, and then you go to the store of the choice. Yeah, so I think it's all yeah, about... I don't know. I mean, you know, I'm like I'm a more of an engineer. It's like I didn't, wouldn't know what one to go for. You I mean, know, you have your Sam Samsung TVs, yeah, you have so. your Sony TVs, exactly. but you're it's all confusing. accessing the same... <laughs> you go into John Lewis and pray you get a good sales guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, right. Okay, I'll give a shout out to our subscription service, actually. Right. So Viveport, our... App Store, we're not just on Vive headsets, we're also right. on Rift and Rift S and Valve yeah, Index and true. Windows Mixed Reality. So if you own any of these headsets, you can download our App Store. Right. And then if you're really into VR, uh, you might want to become a subscriber, so you pay 14.99 euros a month. And then you, we have a library of 800 pieces of content that you can yeah, access yeah, throughout yeah. that month and yeah. pick and choose whether you want to play a game, yeah. whether you want to watch Gloomy Eyes, and you know, every month there is new content yeah. coming in, new experiences coming in. It's like what you say, you know, the business model is still, we're still working yeah. on it, and it, like as you say, the access, where do you find it? And, you know, those are still being created, yeah. It's also but the big you know, media the companies taking a leap of faith yeah. and actually including this content in amongst all that other content. Mm -hmm. And I think it's time for the Amazons and the Netflix of the world to really 
give this content a home and a way for people to access. Ooh, and that's a good thing to end on. It's time for the Amazons and Netflix to give <laughs> this content a home. Yep. Yeah, baby, love it. <laughs> 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 okay, we have to wrap up now because this is the end of, uh, of a long day, but it's been a fascinating panel. It was a great day, actually. Could you please join me in thanking these wonderful VR people for showcasing all this great stuff, right? <laughs> Thank you Thank very you. much. It's been Thank you.